Hi there. Thanks for joining us as we continue our study in First and Second Peter. And today's an especially exciting day because we get to continue on and begin Second Peter. We've just uh, completed our study in First Peter, so it's a really uh, exciting moment for us to get to to move to the second maybe say phase of this study. And I'd like to invite you to join me as we uh, read the scripture that we're studying today. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So as we continue on in our study, we notice that these uh, early verses of Second Peter are just power packed. But as we talk, as we approach the subject of precious faith, I'd like to um, invoke in you the joys of meeting another nerd. Now there was a time in our world nation history where nerd was a very derogatory term. It was something that you didn't want to be called, and you were. Uh, you know, chided maybe for calling someone else saying, oh, you're such a nerd. But then we found out, interestingly, that everybody's a nerd for something. You're a nerd for uh, maybe a sport of your choosing, and you've memorized all the baseball statistics from the 1950s Yankees and all the other uh, interesting possible details of that. And when you meet most people, they go, I have no interest in those, you know, random baseball statistics from more than 60 years ago. And then when you meet someone who does share that passion, what a joy there is in getting to, uh, getting to make that connection with someone who shares uh, shares those interests, those values, those ideas. Um, in Korea, interestingly, when, where my wife and I spent a year and a half uh, teaching English and, and serving in a church, we had the great uh, opportunity of, of meeting a lot of wonderful people. But something very interesting happened, and that was that um, in Korea, everybody is uh, Korean. has an incredibly you know, ethnically... Uh, pure or, or simple population. In other words, everyone, you know, the bulk of the Korean population is Korean by genetics and birth and language. And and so um, when you are not Korean, you know, very unlike America, where we see all sorts of ethnicities and uh, peoples and hear many languages in the course of a day, it's a, it was a far simpler, especially where we were at, uh, simpler culture and simpler place in that regard. Um, and so when you saw another person who was an English speaker, a native English speaker, be they, you know, British, Irish, Australian, from New Zealand, from Canada, from America, it didn't matter. You immediately made that connection with them and all of a sudden found yourself spending a great deal of time with people that you might not otherwise connect with under normal social circumstances. But because you share that one thing in common, that that, that phenomenon of, of, of that commonality and the comfort of just having someone who speaks English, we spent a great deal of time with people we might not have otherwise had an opportunity to uh, invest in. Um, and that is the topic, really, of or part of Peter's focus here, is this idea of understanding how precious our shared faith and how precious the community and connection that we share through faith truly is. So if you, you know, uh, can think about that moment where you're where you're finally meeting someone or connecting to someone who shares your nerdy interest, whatever your nerdy interest uh, might be in, then you're going to have an idea as to how we're really meant to connect in the church or in the body of Christ. So what's new in 2 Peter? Uh, again, we're moving right off of 1 Peter into 2 Peter. And what we find is that the audience um, is, in fact, uh, the same, but they are. it is also a broader audience. Prepared. I didn't have my didn't have my Bible out. Um, the audience is is the same, but it's a broader audience in general. Uh, and what do we mean like by that? Well, we can uh, look at the look at the text itself and find out exactly what we mean by that. If you go to First Peter three one, 
you'll find a, a very clear designation that Peter uh, knows precisely who he's, or to whom rather, he's writing. And so he is writing this second letter he tells them. Here we go. Oh, there it is. He has this second letter that he's writing to them. He says, Beloved, I now write to you in the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. So what is he saying? He's saying that uh, he's already written to them before, that this is the same audience. So then we got to go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 to find out who our audience is. And it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, as we were looking through 1 Peter, we saw that it was plain that um, Peter was writing with a Jewish audience in mind who had been expelled from the area of, of, of um, the Jerusalem area or, or of Israel. All right, of historical Israel. So they had been expelled from that area by various religious persecutions, and that um, caused them to go find this new home, this new place um, in Asia Minor. Now, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, some of them might have had friends or family, and there were Jewish communities there, but here they'd just been expelled for being Christians, so that would have made it a rocky relationship, even with their Jewish uh, you know, compatriots who might have also been out there due to previous Jewish diaspora. But... We point uh, point this out because it is it is valuable to note that the suffering that they endured was exactly what he was, um, what he was giving them instruction how to how to live in uh, suffering and in the specific challenge of having been driven from their homes. It seems to us, um, and then in Second Peter, oh, right, but in both First and Second Peter, we see that he wasn't writing without a Gentile audience in mind. So it wasn't to the exclusion of the Gentile audience. His specific audience was those uh, Jewish Christians whom likely he had some experience with that he knew and he wanted to write to all of them in those areas who had landed there. But the idea that uh, uh, the idea that the church had already been uh, made known to be both Jews and Gentiles was very, very clear. And so, what we have is Peter seemingly broadening that audience and not so much just focusing on um, the Jewish contingent to whom his primary ministry uh, was directed, but also to everybody who had obtained this like precious faith. So we do see that there's commonality that he expected that they had read and understood his first epistle to build on this, uh, to make this one, but also that uh, this is the same group of people, right? But just broader with the, the, the concept that now he'd expected that they'd really probably made friends with some Gentiles and and we'd, were sharing this information with them. Uh, these are also Peter's last written words in the Bible. We, he may have written other things uh, outside of divine inspiration. But in many ways, this is uh, to Peter as Second Timothy is to Paul. It's his swan song. These are his last words. And uh, we're going to see that he writes knowing and understanding his destiny, writes knowing where he's going and uh, that uh, as Jesus had prophesied that he was going to meet a violent end. He was going to meet a violent end upcoming. So, while he's uh, anticipating that, we get to see where his his last words take us and what his final exhortations might mean to us in the church today. The main focus in this epistle is upon growth, and I think there's great value in recognizing that. You see, when Peter had one last message to give, when he had one last word to say by the power of the Holy Spirit, he wanted to make sure that it was a message that you and I need to grow in Christ, that believers need to uh, spiritually grow in what God has provided. So the idea this that continues on through this message is our spiritual growth and the tending to the body and, and tending to our, our spiritual progress, we might say. And finally, we, we can say that uh, with absolute certainty, or as much certainty as we can ever have, that Peter wrote this. It is true that it has been challenged, and it's, it's actually quite interesting, because uh, when you look down at history, we see that books like Second Peter were, um, were challenged in terms of their inclusion into Scripture, but were not uh, challenged in terms of their authorship by the original 
you know, the original recipients and the early church. And so what happens is you have essentially about 18, 17 or 1800 years of church history where people simply uh, trusted and believed that the people who wrote and the people who received these documents knew who was writing and that that was passed reliably on through the faithful, through all these generations of people. And then in you know, again, in 17 or 1800s Germany, you get some Goofenstein who is <laughs> absolutely hell-bent on challenging and questioning the origin and the authorship of every book of the Bible. And so it became kind of in vogue, even though there had been no reason historically, and there's very limited uh, limited reasons in terms of the the historical or uh, textual evidence to, to just say, well, we're pretty sure that Paul didn't write this and we're pretty sure that Peter didn't write this. And yes, well, the original uh, recipients in the early church all uniformly believe that to be the case. We think now coming from, you know, about 2000 years of history in between us that we can probably make a more accurate assessment as to whether or not these uh, documents are original or reliable. If that sounds like poppycock to you, it's because it is poppycock. That's a load of garbage. And it's a tragic load of garbage because it's the way in which the enemy has attacked the Word of God and attacked the trustworthiness, the reliability of the Word of God on things that are, quite frankly, not nearly... Uh, not nearly so central or important as the message of the Bible. And yet it's quite interesting that, that again, the enemy will take any stab, any you know angle that he can to try to decrease people's trust in the Word of God. And authorship is about this. But we can be sure that Peter uh, wrote this because of the testimony of the early church. We can be sure that Peter wrote this because it is... Um, indicative of his language. He signs his name to it, um, and he talks about, on regular occasions, things that Simon Peter would know about. Now, it's really important because when we look at the pseudo-epigraphic works that surround especially the early church, there was a great tendency and a far greater tendency to put your whatever your heretical doctrine was and, and set that out and then try to sign a famous name to it with very, with very without that authenticity, without that ability to, to truly sound like and write like um, that person. And so this uh, author here writes like we'd expect Peter to write. There have been highly exaggerated um, distinctions between the, the Greek in First and Second Peter or between First and Second Peter. Some of that is easily explainable in light of the fact that he probably had uh, Sylvanus help. In fact, he definitely had Sylvanus helping him out to some degree in the writing of 1 Peter, and uh, that's not notated in 2 Peter. Um, it's also possible that in changes in audience and time and message that his writing style would change, just as any of our writing style would change. You might write a letter to a close family member under certain mostly happy conditions and just be giving general updates and advice about life, and then another letter when situations had changed and there was a more urgent message or a, a message of a different urgency, that's going to affect your writing style. And so these claims that we can look at um, uh, at different writing samples and then challenge the authorship them for them are far exaggerated by the academic mind. Um, and as an example of that, you could say if someone found writing samples from you at 16, 22, 25, 36, and 44, and they weren't speaking English, they weren't native English speakers, but 200 years later, whatever language those people who discover those documents say, I don't think that these were written by the same person. Why? Well, they're so different. Yeah, it was written in different periods of their life, right? Different times. I mean, even a week or a night's sleep can change your writing style pretty significantly. So uh, we just want to recognize that while we certainly value and desire to have um, more academic understanding and knowledge of the Bible, that there are even in that, maybe even especially in that, very often um, silly attacks is what we'll call it, silly attacks on the Bible that are really far more about creating a name for some random German theologian than they are about an, a heartfelt and, and earnest and academically honest look at the Bible. So we can be very confident that Peter wrote this epistle. I'm just going to look briefly at a roadmap. Um, I don't... Uh, I'm not looking to uh, outline this very specifically. I just want to give us some signposts along the way. 
that you might see, and this will probably follow, or, or may not, but probably follow how uh, your your Bible is broken up. I've got to look at this in great depth over the past uh, few weeks, and think that the uh, I believe that the the general generally received and approved um, breaks and subject breaks are are reasonable. So one through three is a greeting, and five through eleven we see um, growth become. Or, yeah, I should say one through four is a greeting in the gospel. It starts off with the gospel. Then we see a picture of growth or uh, this this idea of growth putting put forth. Uh, one twelve through fifteen talks about Peter's coming death and uh, how that and how that affects uh, Peter. One sixteen through twenty one is the power of the prophetic word. Two one through three is heretics, and two four through twenty two is the heresy or heresies. Sorry, and two one through three and heretics, the false teachers. In two four through twenty two. Uh, 3, 1 through 13 talks about God's plan for the ages and the surety of his prophetic plan being completed. And finally, 3, 14 through 18 has closing, closing affirmations. So if we were to use this kind of rough outline or maybe these high points of the epistle to point out what was important to Peter in the final message that he would be used by God to deliver, we note that Growth is uh, of primary importance, that believers are meant to grow. That's a, that's a value. The power of the prophetic word, understanding that the prophetic word of God as it's contained in the Bible is of import to every believer. And we need to constantly be on the lookout for false teachers and false teaching. It's not that we need to become heresy hunters, you know, out on some sort of wish, witch hunt, trying to misunderstand and misinterpret anything anyone says almost intentionally, if, pos- if need be, uh, in order to find the way that people were wrong. But far to the contrary, we need to be on the alert with understanding and with grace and, uh, and compassion for those who might be just honestly misled. Um, we need to keep an eye out for false teaching because false teaching, bad doctrine, makes bad living. So, and finally, we see that importance of understanding God's plan for the ages and patiently and humbly awaiting him and his return in that time. So with that, we're ready to get into the introduction. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So Peter first identifies himself with his name. He says he's Simon Peter. He was just Peter in the last one. Now remember, Peter, you might say, is his work name. That is the title that the Lord Jesus Christ gave him in connection to the confession of the Lord's uh, of Jesus' uh, deity and Christhood, if you like. Um, so that is his moniker, if you like, for him to be recognized as an important part of the leadership of the early church, and particularly his leadership qualities within the context of the apostles. Um, and, and yet he also had his original birth name, Simon, and he uses both here. And I don't think it's going too far to point out that in First Peter, there seems to be more of an introductory feel to it. Maybe he's, he's, he's getting to know them after a fashion in this letter. And so he seems to approach them less personally and more professionally. And here that uh, he's maybe had some more experience with them or maybe gotten correspondence or feedback from them. And now he reminds them that he's Simon Peter. He said, yes, I'm the one who is chosen by God for this very special office, this very special place in the church, but I'm also just Simon. I'm also just the guy who, uh, who's imperfect, who's growing, who's coming along. And, and really, it's one of the, I'd say, one of the true uh, marks and, and defining features of Peter's writing is that he who is so blustery and so, you know, so often, so frequently he may have had his foot in his mouth in the biblical context became very humble became very genuine, became very authentic, talked about caring for souls and growth. And uh, he wasn't the, the same blustery, loud uh, person that we see. Um, he was still strong, still very strong. But even in his writing, he uses very few imperatives. He's just describing them, describing godliness to them in such a way that says, I know you're walking with Jesus. I know you're doing this. I know you're doing that. I know you're growing in your uh growing in health and grace and so on. So um, the way that Peter writes is is very gentle and very loving, and it's worth noting. So he identifies himself here as Simon Peter. 
And he tells us he's a bond servant, he's a doula. So in, in the uh, Gentile culture, this wouldn't be uh, so much a bond servant as a slave, right? As the, the idea of um, a person who had been either voluntarily or involuntarily brought into uh, service to a master. Right. Obviously, it shows and gives the picture in any culture of the idea of a person who is uh, um, whose will is entirely subjugated to that of his master. However, what we see with Peter, and this is quite uh, valuable, quite important to note, is that Peter, of course, comes from the Jewish or Hebrew background. And in the Hebrew background, there was no situation wherein a person was meant to be a slave forever. You might become someone's slave because you owed them money. You might become a slave for uh, because of some hardship or difficulty that had fallen upon you. You might be born into slavery, but no one was meant, apparently, to be a slave forever. It was meant to exist for a time period until such time as you'd paid back your debt or paid off your uh, criminal offense or and even until the year of Jubilee uh, might come. However, there was an exception to this in Mosaic Law, and that was that if a person loved their master, as would often uh, likely be the case, you see, um, when we think of slavery, we think of the horrors of American slavery in our, in our history, but slavery was a far more understood and expected institution. You see, if you became someone's slave, they were going to take care of you. You no longer had to worry about providing your own food, your own housing, potentially. You got included in the prosperity of that household, not necessarily as well as maybe the children of that household, but you were taken care of. Someone else took responsibility for you so that you could go about whatever way that you were serving them without distraction, right? Without concern, without worry. So the idea of, of, of slavery uh, wasn't as repugnant historically as we find it because, again, um, they, they understood it and used that institution differently. So if a person in Jewish culture, and in Old Testament culture particularly, had been sold into slavery to another or somehow come under the control of another, but loved their master and loved and wanted to serve them, and they would take an awl and they would puncture their ear against the doorpost or the lintel of a house as a symbolic gesture that now their blood, their, their uh, servitude was attached to this household. It was physically painful right, you know, of passage if you chose to do it, but it showed in great uh, symbolic meaning and power that you were now attached to, permanently attached to uh, this household, that you've chosen this uh, slavery, you've chosen to serve this person, this family as your uh, master. Um, and that's the picture that I believe Peter invokes here. And we want to make that very clear because we're not, uh, we're, we are hopefully not those who confuse discipleship with salvation. You see, salvation comes by believing in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who gave up his life on the cross to pay for your sin and my sin so that we might be made alive and restored to God. So believing in his sacrifice for our sin, by trusting in him, if we want to say that, but by believing that he died for you, you are born again, you are made alive, um, you are w walking with him. There is another step, if you like, and that is becoming a disciple of Jesus, uh, if, as, as the Bible presents it. And so distinct from salvation, but certainly uh, should be after salvation, is the choice to actually serve Christ with your life in order to put his desires above our own. And of course, that's meant to be the path of every believer. Every believer is meant to grow from just a spiritual babe born again into a fully mature person who is serving Christ with our lives, with his life or with her life. This is meant, that's the design for us, but truthfully, not all believers will make that choice. Some will trust Jesus Christ and flounder, sadly, throughout their life. But Paul, uh, Peter here and Paul alike use this term, I've made the choice to subjugate in every sense my will to the, the will of the Lord. I've chosen to do his will over uh, my own. Now, there are those who conflate these two th separate parts of the faith. And the reality is, is that 
um, not even all the disciples of Jesus were saved in the in the earthly ministry of Christ, and certainly not all people who are disciples or learners from Jesus are saved today. There are many people who are great students of the words of the life of Jesus Christ who view him as an example of some kind and truly dedicate themselves to trying to obey or do what Jesus Christ taught and said. And yet they're not saved because they have not trusted in Jesus Christ. These are two separate uh, functions, if you like. The choice to be a disciple has n uh, little to do with your salvation. Because as we've been mentioned, you can be a disciple of Jesus without being saved by Jesus, without trusting him for salvation. Um, and this is the problem with uh, lordship salvation and those, and again, it's a tragic, uh, tragically over- exposed in Christianity. In fact, many, 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 many churches teach this idea that you're really not saved until you've made him Lord of your life. And they've um, taken these two different ideas, important ideas in scripture, and conflated them into one. So in other words, you're not saved until you've believed and you're doing some works and you've become a disciple and you've made him Lord and you've chosen to be his bondservant. And yet nothing could be further from the truth. And Peter here even makes that case. He doesn't say we are all bondservants. He says, I'm a bondservant. The other thing we note is this talks about the humility of Peter. The humility of Peter to say that whatever else I am and whatever, you know, reason I have or authority I have to write with you, I am still only a slave, a bondservant, a voluntary bondservant of the God of the universe. He doesn't say he's a master in the household of God. He says he's a slave. Uh, so obviously a low social standing or stigma there showing his humility. And he says he's an apostle. He identifies himself here, um, both with that humility of the fact that he's not, you know, claiming to be this hoity-toity and high and mighty, but he's also reminding them that he has been given this special office. Now, an apostle is a specially sent one, one who is especially sent with the authority to see his message uh, completed or executed. So a messenger just comes and gives a message and says, this is the message from the king. It's in your court now. I'm out of here. An apostle like Peter and Paul goes and has given the authority to see it executed. And so the apostles were given various uh, supernatural uh, giftings and abilities and were able to represent the truth of the word of God and do miracles in order to uh, demonstrate the truth and reliability of the word of God. And that's how they operated as such. So he's an apostle. It's a very special, unique um, ministry, a one-time ministry in church history wherein God built on the foundation of these apostles and prophets and brought forth the written word of God through them. So he's reminding them with his apostolic authority that he is writing to them in the official capacity. This isn't just a love note. This is God's uh, word, God's spirit speaking through Peter using uh, Peter's vocabulary. So it gives us a picture that Peter knew he was writing from his apostolic um, position in this. And it's to those of like precious faith. I believe it's uh, J. Vernon McGee who points out that you should look at precious as being one of one of Peter's words. You know, you got some of this, uh, some of the some of the people in your life around you might use certain vocabulary with some frequency. Um, I was once up at Camparete, and and uh, at the end, all the students or certain students got up and and uh, did impressions of all the various staff members. It was hilarious. But the young man who imitated me said, it's just so beautiful. <laughs> and it's true. I do love to use the word beautiful. <laughs> and so Peter loves to use the word precious. Uh, and that idea of value, of, of a very great intrinsic value, something that is meant to be, and, and precious even in English gives us this idea of something that, that we care for, that we admire, that we hold on to, something that is um, of, of greater uh, import in our lives than we might be able to imagine. And so this is to those of that like precious faith. And we want to note that this is of all value for us to note, to remember. We want to take this into mind. What connects you to other believers is your shared faith in Jesus Christ. What will build intimacy and fellowship in your relationships between others and between, again, you and Jesus and, and various other possibilities. What builds that up 
is your willingness to walk towards Christ together. It might be easier to share fellowship, and this is with uh, this is the sad thing that I see with the modern church today. Right, people will go to a church that largely consists of people who look like them, or in their same socioeconomic group, who are in their same kind of walk of life and age of life. And tragically, even uh, most churches today will have this these ideas of small group ministries, and not to demonize that in general, but in specific, most fo- small group ministries that I've witnessed are basically a way of making six or eight friends or whatever it is within the church that look exactly like you. So this is the young adult small group, and this is the older adult small group, and this is the you know single small group, and this is the, oh my goodness, sectioning each other off from the wisdom and the shared life experience that we're meant to have. However, we're not meant to be united by our socioeconomic connections. We're not meant to be united by our politics and a shared political viewpoint. We're meant to be united over Jesus Christ, his gospel, and his word. That's what brings unity. We let other things divide us in the church, and that is tragic because we're meant to be united around our like precious faith. That is our trust in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross for us. That's a big deal. Because it's easier to connect, or it might seem easier to connect over other things. There's a vulnerability in sharing your like precious faith. It's easier to talk about the weather or talk about politics. It's easier to talk about sports. It's easier to talk about current events. But you're meant to share in your fellowship in Christ. So that means making a choice, a choice to talk about what the Lord is doing in your life, a choice to pray together, a choice to open scripture together. You got to make that choice in order to experience those that growth in those relationships. If you're not doing that, then I promise you you're not receiving the fullness and the in the um, fullness and joy of fellowship that you're meant to have in the church. And I would say, just as a pastor, I very frequently will hear uh, people, not very frequently, but with some frequency, over 10 years, will hear people come in and complain about there not being anyone, or the fellowship is cold, or they're not getting enough, enough attention, or whatever it is they feel. And then conversely, you get other people who come in and immediately say, I'm just, I'm so connected with, I've never been so connected. And the sole difference is... The ones who feel so connected are the ones who are uh, delving into the study of word of God, the Word of God with their brothers and sisters in the Lord. The ones who feel disconnected are the ones who are not connecting with their brothers and sisters over spiritual things, right? So it doesn't matter where they go. They could go to the friendliest church in the world and you know be invited out for donuts and coffee every morning and go to the church bowling league every Thursday, and they're still not going to experience that intimacy and connection that we truly long for, because what we truly long for is that, and need, and we're built to need, is that connection around our like precious faith around Jesus Christ. It's very important. Um, And he says, with us, and I take this to be the apostles. You have obtained like precious faith with us. Um, It could be just speaking of the church where he's from. Uh, or where he is at at the time, but I think the specific viewpoint here is he's saying that the apostolic faith, as it had been revealed, so the believers also received and then shared this common identity. There was no uh, true hierarchy within, uh, in terms of access to God. He said, you've received it with us. We're all co-inheritors. We're all co-participants in this important idea of the like precious faith. So while we have different functions, we might be apostles, we might be elders, we might be evangelists, we might be we have the gift of mercy, administration, or helps, but we all truly stand in same with the same access to the God of the universe. So it's a very important uh, little point brought along here by the text, and it says, uh, by the righteousness. So here, he says, those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, um, yeah, so we've obtained this this precious faith by the righteousness. And this is the word, um, this dikaios family of Greek words is where we get our dikaiosune word, which is translated justification. So this picture of a received righteousness, this righteousness received by faith is central to Peter's letter. Why is that? Well, it becomes very important because Peter never wants to leave the gospel out. It's a really cool uh, feature of his writing anyway. But also, 
because he's going to go into giving quite a few uh, commands and instruction about how believers are then meant to live and react and respond and grow. But he wants to start off by reminding everybody that whatever happens after your salvation and how you grow, um, that your ultimate salvation is by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. And it's not our right, our righteousness, but it is the righteousness, the right standing of Jesus Christ that enables us to be in that relationship once again with God. So now we see this final statement here, and it's a beautiful one indeed, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now the Greek uh, is extraordinarily clear and well translated in the New King James here, and any other main mainline uh, translation that I've been exposed to, and that is that our God and Savior are both phrases referring to or describing the same person that is then uh, stated as Jesus Christ. The point, Peter knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ was God. And so when we think about the Trinity, and while yes, it is uh, true that the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, the concept, the theological concept of the unity or the triunity of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, separate in uh, person, but united in essence, is a, the uniform teaching of Scripture. And you say, oh, but I can't understand that. That blows my mind. Good. It should. Think about it. If you could fully understand God, if he fit entirely in terms of his nature and character, what he is, then you've got a God that is a part of this system. In fact, probably more likely you've got a God that you've created rather than the reality that the God who created us is um, not beyond knowing. He's not unknowable. He's not inscrutable in that sense, but he is beyond um, understanding. We'll never come to a full understanding of how God works because he is the one who made us to work and he hasn't made us to understand him in, uh, in that full and final way, right? We can, mercy, we can't even come to a final and full understanding of each other or all the miracles of nature. Why would we be able to uh, come to a uh, an understanding, a complete understanding of God in that sense of the word? So here we see, uh, again, a clear statement that everybody in the early church uniformly understood that Jesus Christ both claimed to and proved, authenticated his claims, to be the Son of God, to be uh, be with God, to be God in his very essence. It was uh, the uniform writing of John. We've seen the uniform writing of Peter, Paul. There's no biblical text that could bring any challenge to the clear teaching of the deity of Jesus Christ. And then he moves on to grace and peace. We see this is a modified greeting for a mixed audience, as Paul used, or Peter used in both. And Paul also used. Um, the Greek greeting would tend to be grace, um, or at least a modification of the idea of grace. The, the Christians, it seems, kind of modified this idea that the grace was from God. And so grace would be uh, this idea of uh, blessing and undeserved and un, you know, contingent blessing, non-contingent blessing was very, very important to the early, uh, the, the Gentile believers and, and appealed to them in understanding. And also uh, peace or shalom, right? It's uh, Irene in the Greek, but um, shalom was and still is the standard Jewish greeting. So both of these greetings um, would help people realize that both Jews and Gentiles and Jewish and Gentile Christians are in view here. If uh, Peter had just meant to write to the, uh, the Hebrew audience, he would have pro likely only selected peace, and if only the Gentile, maybe only grace, but it's both. However, we want to note that this grace and peace isn't just well wishes, it's not just an empty formality, because the grace of God is the uh, system under which we are meant to live, if you want to call it a system. The reality of our very existence is by the grace of God and by his grace alone, by his no strings attached gifting to us and, and loving of us. Um, and so how do we appropriate this grace and peace? Well, Peter tells us, he's been, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. So grace and peace are meant to be multiplied, how? By knowing God and by knowing Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, this is a very important equation that Peter's making. He's telling us, and he's going to repeat this idea throughout this introduction, is that there's a, the key step in growing in, in our spiritual growth is learning, is learning, 
learning to know who God is, what God is like, what God desires, what God's plan is, and who Jesus Christ is like. Uh, who Jesus Christ is, what he is like, what he desires, and what the plan is. That is how we're meant to grow in the faith. And then he says that God has given us by God's supernatural power. Okay, so he says his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And this is a very common message in Scripture. We want to make note that God is supernaturally involved in our salvation. He's supernaturally involved in our growth. It is by His grace that we're saved. It's by His grace that we are growing. And it is by His grace that we are ultimately conformed to the image of Christ and um, at the final our glorification. It is all a function of God's perfect grace. I've written down 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, and 19 through 21, that God's supernatural power is being poured out in our lives through Jesus Christ, uh, through God's grace towards us. God has given us everything that we need. So what is it that we're lacking? Well, we lack nothing in terms of what we need to grow in life and godliness. We need only rely upon the resources that he's given us in Jesus Christ. And in order to do that, we need to learn what those resources are and how to rely upon them. Um, we could be given any number of things, a beautiful sweater or, or a, a very important tool to finish a job. Someone could give us that thing. But if we leave it in the in the box or, or take it, leave it in the wrapping, then we never enjoy the benefit of that thing. It's still ours. We still possess it, maybe. But uh, it, we don't enjoy the, the, the benefit of it. Really, the best picture that I can think of uh, is in terms of a man who is starving to death. And so everyone around him fills his cupboards with all of the best foods in the world and then uh, that they can provide. And then the next week they find his cold, dead body lying on the floor. <laughs> because while he'd been given everything that he needed to nourish himself, he chose not to eat. And that really is what uh, most of our Christian life or many Christian people uh, experience. They've been given everything they need to live a godly life that uh, pleases God and that uh, is constantly in growing, growing in the fruit of the Spirit and the like, and yet we just kind of choose not to. We choose not to rely upon what he's given. We try to do it ourselves. We try to do it by the works of our hands. We try to do it by our scheming and our planning and our hard effort. And this is, again, where the the uh, heresy of lordship salvation is so demonic and so destructive because you get people who are trying to prove their salvation by working according to the flesh rather than growing and abiding in the in Jesus Christ and walking by means of his spirit in order to produce his good works to see growth in his life. So, and all this is said to become through something. It's just through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue. So, have you ever gotten a card or a gift through the computer, you know, or through the mail? It's the same idea. This gift comes through, again, the knowledge of him. Are you seeing a pattern here? We're meant to know Jesus. We're meant to know him more. Um, to put this very, very simply, you need to open your Bible. You need to be in Bible class. You need to be taking in good teaching, whether that's in uh, books that you read or through uh, sermons that you listen to throughout the week, or, and certainly most importantly, if it's available to you, reading the Bible daily and, and meditating and thinking on what you've been uh, shown. And I want to point this out because it's often pointed out and saying, you know, that this is how you make Pharisees. So learning the Bible does not guarantee that you will grow. But if you don't learn the Bible, you're guaranteed not to grow. Do you see how that works? It's a big deal. Very important. If you learn the Bible, you are not guaranteed to believe it, to let it shape your life, to let it shape the choices you make. You're, you're not guaranteed to listen to it and humbly understand it. You can bring our own misunderstandings to it and twist it and, and be, have it twisted by others. So you're not guaranteed to grow just by taking in the Bible. However, if you don't take in the Bible, you're guaranteed not to grow. You're guaranteed to flounder in immaturity. This is very, very critically important um, because oftentimes people will point to this person or that person who has great biblical knowledge but no Christ-likeness of life in them, and thus they're not inspired to know the Bible more because they see that this person's life does not adorn the Word of God. However, that's a false connection. It's a false conclusion to come to. So 
Finally, we look at this calling, and here we have this calling. How is he calling us to him? By his glory and virtue. So as uh, as both as unbelievers and believers, one of the things that we perceive is the glory of God, the radiant essence of who he is, and his virtue, his, his, his central character, his righteousness, his holiness, his power. And that calls us, that draws us in further to knowing him, further to knowing his provision, further to knowing his promise. We're called forth by that virtue and glory. And then he talks about these exceeding precious promises. And the Bible is filled with, maybe not as many promises as some people take, but the Bible is filled with promises, like the promise of forgiveness in Ephesians 1.7. Forgiven of all sins, past, present, and future. You have a completed forgiveness in Jesus Christ. The promise of your identification with Christ in Ephesians 2, 6, and 7. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are buried with him. You are raised with him. You are ascended with him. You are seated with him. You're made alive with him always uh, in Christ. If The only way for you to perish is for him to perish, for you are identified with him. The promise of your new birth, the promise of your new birth in Christ is um, a, a guaranteed fact. You're born into this newness of life. The promise of eternal life, life that is unending, undis- indestructible, and completely yours. Everlasting life has been promised to anyone who trusts in Christ. Um, And that's a promise you can count on. It's an exceedingly precious promise. You have the promise of a hope and a future that no matter what happens in this life, in the life to come, that you will be uh, made into the image of Christ. You've been conformed, rather, uh, transformed into the image of Christ, and you will be with him forever. You have a hope and a future of ruling and reigning with him um, in in the kingdom of Christ on earth and then going on to the new heavens and the new earth, you have, he, you have the promise that he will redeem this planet earth, that he has a plan that, uh, that involves some difficult roads ahead, difficult things ahead, but ultimately will result in his redemption of planet earth. And this final point here, is of uh, is is a beautiful thing to notice. He says that these you may be through these rather these precious promises you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So understanding first of all, understanding your identification, Peter, Paul, this is the uniform teaching of Scripture. Understanding your identification with Christ is the central key, the primary first key to growing in Christ. Okay, so. Um, uh, what this means for us is that we need to understand and trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We need to understand and trust in our identification with him, our co-seating in the right hand of the Father, and our life being hidden away with him in order to understand how we're meant to live and how to grow effectively. This is very important because, and it also tells us that uh, we have escaped through this identification in the divine nature and our identification in Jesus Christ, our partake or our ability to partake or share in common that divine nature of God through Jesus Christ has given us the destiny of having escaped the corruption escape the corruption or depravity of this world. This world is corrupt. It is falling apart, right? Genesis 3 records the time when sin entered this world, and uh, Romans 5.12 tells us that uh, when sin entered the world through Adam, death entered through sin. That was the first spiritual death, and then physical death, decay, sickness, heartache, pain, all of the horrible things that we see around us entered in this world, and ultimately this world will come to an end, having reached the end of its corruption. Entropy will find, would finally win and destroy it. We know that'll happen at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. So, to conclude our introduction, celebrate this week. You're like precious faith. Talk to, call, write letters, connect with other believers, and celebrate what you share in common, your faith in Jesus Christ, your faith in the gospel, your hope for the future. Next, understand that we have been saved from the destruction of this world and saved to eternal life in Jesus Christ. And as an appropriate response to that, we're meant to grow uh, in that knowledge. So let's close our study with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the great gift of this day and this study, uh, these wonderful words you've given us. Please bless this uh, this teaching. Please bless the, uh, the time that we spent considering your word. And please use that word to transform 
us from glory to glory. Let us no longer think after the ways of our flesh or our culture, but let us be conformed to your word and your spirit and your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God richly bless you, and I hope you're able to continue the study with us in weeks to come.